All right, well, good morning. Again, my name is Andrew. It's so good to be with you all. Um, little known fact, uh, your pastor, Pastor Scott Deneen, uh, is a good friend of mine. He's actually the Presbytery's chairman. I, I mentioned this with the adult discipleship class this morning, but he is actually the chairman for Presbytery's RUF committee. So he's a... Uh, not quite my boss, but sort of my boss, uh, as close to a boss as I have, I suppose, uh, here uh, in this part of God's kingdom. And I'm just so thankful uh, for Scott, for his love for the Lord, uh, for his um, testimony and walk walk with the Lord through grace. And I just, I know that he is such a blessing to you all and um, just give thanks that he is here uh, with you all. And I give thanks to you for, for supporting the work of RUF on Davidson's campus. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without the prayers and the support uh, of not just you all, but of other uh, sister churches across, across North Carolina. Well, this morning our passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I'd invite you to turn there uh, with me. Uh, verses 17 through 21. We're mainly going to be just looking at verse 21 this morning. Um, and uh, yes, I'll have you stand in just a second for the reading of God's word. But wanted to give uh, verses 17 through 21 as a bit of context, just so we know kind of what is going on. And um, along those lines, a word of context, this is um, uh, a letter that the Apostle Paul has written to one of the churches that he planted. Um, so he faithfully taught them uh, about Jesus and the gospel, and now he's writing to them. And uh, what's interesting to note is that even though this is a well-established church, for goodness sakes, it had the Apostle Paul as its church planter, even still they have to be reminded of one of the core truths of the gospel. And isn't that true for all churches? It doesn't matter who founded your church. It doesn't matter how long you've been established. Uh, we all, Christians all, need to be reminded of the core truths of the gospel. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning, this core truth known as justification, the doctrine of justification. So with that, would you please stand with me as you're able uh, for the reading of God's word. Again, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. This is God's word. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, we ask for your blessings upon the reading and preaching and teaching of your word. Lord, would the words of my mouth the meditations of all of our hearts, <clears throat> pleasing in your sight, the Lord our rock and our redeemer. We pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Amen. Well, I imagine as you heard that the theme for this morning's sermon is going to be justification, maybe you fell into one of two camps. Either you heard that and you were super excited because you knew just how important this doctrine is. And so you can't wait to hear what God's word has to say about justification. That might be some of you. Others of you might have heard that we're going to be talking of justification. You might have thought, what is with Presbyterians and all these long five-syllable words? Justification, sanctification, glorification, predestination. Can't we just kind of speak normally? Um, if that's you, thank you for bearing with us and for being here. But I, I mentioned that um, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but just to say that this idea, this doctrine, this teaching of the Bible known as justification, it can sometimes seem and feel a bit heady. It can seem a bit cold. 
um, it can seem just hard to grasp and understand. It can seem a bit impersonal. <clears throat> and what I want us to see from God's word this morning is that it is one of the most personal of personal doctrines and that it matters for everyone. It's not just for Presbyterians or for super elite Christians. This is for every <clears throat> single believer. In fact, it's for every single human. And I'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but basically, if you're, if you're the type to um, take notes or to follow along, we're going to be talking about three things this morning. First, and just really simply, just a few words about justification. Second, a few pictures of justification. And then third, so what? What difference does, the, does justification make in our everyday lives? So let's just jump right in, shall we? So a few words about justification. I want to give us a definition and a description. So I would define justification from God's word in this way. Justification is God declaring sinners, like you and me, to be righteous. God declaring sinners to be righteous. Or to put it a different way, God declaring guilty people innocent. Think of a judge in that sense. God declaring guilty people innocent. So that's the basic definition. If you wanted to get fancier with it, you could go with the Westminster Shorter Catechism's definition which says justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all of our sin and accepts us as righteous in his sight. Again, that's a bit wordy. There's a lot of religious jargon thrown in there. Um, I mean, not only is there the word justification, but I said catechism. We talked about grace and pardon, sin, and again, the, the, the assumption might be that justification is only for religious people. Only Christians, only these kind of super elite Christians are concerned with justification. And again, that's just not the case. Every single person is concerned about justification. Everyone from the Christian down to the atheist is concerned with justification. Can I prove this to you? Finish this sentence in your mind with me. I will finally be able to rest when... Go ahead and finish that sentence in your head. I will finally be able to rest when... Maybe that's... I'll finally be able to rest when I retire. When I send my kids off to college. When I pay off the mortgage. I'll finally be able to rest when... Uh, I know that my children are walking with the Lord. What is it for you? How do you finish that sentence? The way that you finish that sentence, I'll finally be able to rest when, points to what you think will justify you. It points to that thing that you think will tell you you're all right. Everything is going to be okay. You're good. You're fine. You don't have to worry anymore. Now, the Bible gives us good news and bad news. So I'm going to start with the bad news and then make our way to the good news. The bad news, as you might expect, is that none of these things that we look to to give us rest, to tell us that we're enough, that we're okay, none of these things will fully satisfy us. Because none of these things really speak to the core of who we are. They don't speak to our core identity. They don't speak to our core problem. And none of these things are guaranteed to last. They can all be and all are fleeting. Temporary, yes. That's the bad news. The good news is that God offers you a lasting justification that really does speak to the core of who you and who I am. That's the good news. So how does the justification that God offers work? We've defined it. Um, but how would we describe how justification works? Look with me at verse 21. We'll give a brief description. So in verse 21 of chapter 5, Paul says, For our sake, God, he, God, made him, Christ Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. There's two things here that I want to highlight for us. The first is that 
this <clears throat> verse is, is where we get this idea of the great exchange. Maybe some of you have heard of this. Or double imputation, to use fancy theological terminology. But the, the whole idea behind the great exchange <clears throat> is simply our sin is exchanged for his, Jesus' righteousness. It's a trade. It's an exchange. So imagine the record of all of your wrongs, all of your lies, all of your addictions, all of your grudges, all of your lusts, all of your pride, all of that. Imagine that credited to Jesus' account while his sinless, perfect track record is credited to your account, to my account, to our account. That's the great exchange, that one-for-one -one exchange. His innocence exchanged for our wickedness, our rebellion, our guilt. Now, anyone with a sense of justice or equity is going to wonder, how does this happen? How can, how can we exchange all of our wrongdoing and the record of all of our sin for his perfect righteousness? And that's the second thing I want to point out from this verse. The answer lies in two little words in the very middle of verse 21. Do you know what those two little words are? The words, in him. In him. This explains how this exchange happens. Because... What Paul is getting at here with, by saying that this happens in him, in Jesus, is that 2,000 years ago, through his sacrificial death on the cross, at that moment, Jesus accomplished your justification. At that moment, Jesus satisfied God's righteous anger and indignation over our sin. It's not like he left it, let it go unpunished. It's not like he just kind of canceled the record. No, he, he nailed it to the cross in and through Jesus. Jesus received all the punishment that we deserved so that we could receive all of the rights, all of the privileges that he deserves. And furthermore, the very moment that you believe in Jesus, at that precise moment, everything that he accomplished on the cross 2,000 years ago, it gets applied to your account. At that very moment, the moment you believe, you are justified. God looks at you and he sees perfection because he sees the perfection of his only begotten son. Let that sink in. Take a moment. Let this sink in. In God's sight, you are every bit, every bit as holy, as righteous, as blameless as his only son. Jesus Christ. If that weren't true, that would be blasphemy. But it is true. Yeah. When Jesus, or what Jesus accomplished on the cross 2,000 years ago, it gets applied to you the moment that you believe. And that's not something you can lose. This is why Genesis, the first book of the Bible in the Old Testament, Genesis 15, verse 6, it's why it's like one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. Because in Genesis, Genesis, verse, uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, speaking of Abraham, God says that, And Abraham believed the Lord, and he, God, counted it to Abraham as righteousness. The point being that our father in the faith, Father Abraham, was justified through faith. And so are we. We are justified through faith. We are pardoned and accepted, again, using that language from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, only for the righteousness of Christ, imputed to us, and what? Received by faith alone. Okay, so if that's what justification is, brief definition, if that's how it works and kind of a description of it, what does justification look like? So I want to turn to two pictures of justification. And the first is a backpack. So back in February, before the world changed and before everything got shut down uh, because of COVID, my wife Amanda and I, we took a, a, a short four-day trip to celebrate our five-year anniversary. And we um, had a pretty, you know, we had a set budget 
and we wanted to, to stretch it and make the most of it. And we decided we were going to go to Brooklyn, New York, just the two of us. We found a, a, a cheap flight on the most budget of budget airlines and um, found an affordable hotel. And we just were like, we're going to spend our money on food and experiences, and we're just going to enjoy a few days up in Brooklyn. Well, what I didn't account for was that um, the airport that we were going to fly into was probably the furthest of all the New York airports from our hotel. Not only that, the airline that we chose, uh, our plane ticket only assured us a seat. Everything else was extra. And I'm not talking just the, you know, the peanuts and the soda, but even a carry-on was extra. The only thing, I, I take it back, you, your, your ticket got you a seat, and it got you one personal bag. Why am I telling you all this? <laughs> well, Amanda and I, just you know, the brilliant uh, the people that we are, uh, we decided, you know what? We're not going to get a carry-on. We're not going to check a bag. We're going to fit everything we need for our trip in two backpacks. That's it. So she had a backpack. I had a backpack for about five days. So we did that. We got these bags. We, we, I think it was actually that bag right there. Just kind of jammed them full. And we, we flew into New York. But then we've got this long trek right to our hotel. It's the furthest airport to the hotel. So I just want you to imagine my wife and I kind of uh, trekking through New York, just way down with these big overstuffed backpacks, uh, crammed with clothes and toiletries, everything we need. Um, riding the subway, take, you know, walking through city streets. Uh, not only did we need to go over to the hotel, but we wanted to go to breakfast first because it was a, essentially a red eye. So we ended up finding this New York deli um, reviewed highly on Yelp. And as, as soon as we get there, it took us about an hour to get there from the, from the airport. We were tired. We were just kind of trucking like, trucking, like pack mules all across the city. Those bags, look, the straps are starting to dig into our shoulders. We were exhausted. And we get to the deli, and because it's highly reviewed, it's packed. It's sort of like, oh, no. Uh, it was hard to see, you know, there, there were hardly any uh, places for us, let alone our, our bags, right? Uh, thankfully, there was one open table, and there was a couple sitting down, having breakfast next to the open table, who saw us and took pity on us. They could tell that we had just kind of traveled. We must have been sweating and red-faced and hunched over. And the, the husband, or who I assume to be the husband, looked at me and he said, here, let me take that for you. And offered to take our bags and put it in this tiny little corner next to his table where there just happened to be some free extra space. And uh, that just goes to show you that New Yorkers, they can be nice. Um, and uh, they're not all uh, gruff and, you know, hey, I'm walking here. Um, why am I telling you this? Justification means that you and I, who try to go through life carrying on our own these heavy burdens of all the guilt and the shame that comes from our sin, we're just so exhausted. And we've got no place to put these, no place to rest these burdens. And justification is Jesus looking at you and me, having pity on you and me, and saying, here, let me take that for you. You don't have to carry that anymore. Yeah. So believer, think of those sins that the devil tries to to remind you of and to convince you that you, you're too far gone to actually be a child of God. And remember that Jesus has taken that burden off your back. That's the picture of justification. Peter, the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 24, speaking of Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And then, hallelujah, praise the Lord, he says, by his wounds, you have been healed. You've been healed. That's the good news of justification. <clears throat> That's one picture. Another picture um, is the picture of a lab coat. So growing up in, I should have said this, growing up in New York, I could, have, I could 
give New Yorkers a hard time because I am a New Yorker uh, by birth. Um, but growing up in New York, my dad uh, was and still is a physician. And when I was young, probably about eight or nine, he would actually take me to work with him. So he'd take me into this big city hospital, this training hospital up in New York. And um, <clears throat> hospitals can be scary places for adults, let alone an eight or nine year old with all the kind of noises and sounds and strange smells, right? But whenever I would go to the hospital with my dad, I wouldn't be afraid. <clears throat> because whenever we would show up, he would actually take his lab coat, his white lab coat, and he would put it on me, little old eight-year-old Andrew. Um, so, so you can imagine me wearing my dad's white lab coat. I'm swimming in this thing, all the fabric kind of you know billowing behind me. It's almost like a tr like a train <laughs> uh, dragging along the floor behind me, and it's 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 white as snow and over you know over the the chest or over my heart. My dad's name stitched in black lettering, Juan Goisbleta, MD. And my dad would drape his stethoscope around my neck, and then he and I would go through the hospital and do rounds together. He would see his patients. Um, and as I was with my dad, doors would open for me that had no business opening for me. I had access to all different parts of the hospital because I was with my dad. I even had access, believe it or not, to the inner sanctum the Holy of Holies, the doctor's lounge, a place where no one else dare go, right? It's kind of like, you know, when you're in high school, it's like the, the teacher's lounge. It's like, oh my goodness, this is holy ground. Not only that, whenever we would cross paths with another doctor or a nurse or one of my dad's colleagues, they would see me wearing my dad's robe with the stethoscope, and they would smile and they would greet me, you know, with all this respect and say, Dr. Goizueta, so good to see you, shake my hand. They would call me Dr. G. They would bestow upon me the, the title that I took my dad four years of medical school and however much money to earn. They would call me Dr. Goizueta. And I did nothing to earn any of that. Not that respect, not that access, not that title, none of it. But I was dressed in my dad's lab coat. I was wearing that white robe. His name was over my heart. The title that he earned was given to me. Do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. Justification says you've got all the rights and privileges, all the respect and honor, even that title, the name above every name. You have that title, beloved son stitched over your heart. And you have access to the inner sanctum, not of the doctor's lounge, but to the Holy of Holies itself, to the very presence of your Heavenly Father. Because you're wearing the white robes of Christ. Because his name is permanently etched over your heart, and because you're united to him through faith. This is exactly what the prophet Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 61, verse 10, when he says, The Lord has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news of justification. And as we sing about, as the hymn goes, we are dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless, faultless to stand before the throne. Okay, so we've talked about what justification is, how it works. Uh, we've looked at a few pictures of justification, but what difference does it make? So what? What difference does it make in our everyday sorts of lives? This is our last point, the so what. And I'll just say this. If we are justified by Jesus' finished work on the cross, and if we're justified through faith in him and him alone, then then, pay a close attention to this, we are not justified by who we vote for. We're not justified by whether we're married or single. We're not justified by whether our children are walking with the Lord or not. We're not justified whether we send our kids to public school or Christian school or home school. We're not justified even by being a good Christian. We're not justified by going to church by reading our Bibles, by praying, by tithing. 
If you thought you were, I am sorry, you're not justified by those things. None of those things will justify you. Only Jesus will justify you. If you think about it, all those things we look to you to, to justify us, our political alliances, how we raise our kids, whether we're a good Christian or not, we're all comparing ourselves to others. I vote for this person, but he votes for that person. I'm justified. They send their kids to public school? We only send our kids to private Christian school. All these things are we're, we're measuring ourselves up against other people, and we're always going to fall short. That's what Jesus says in Luke 18, his parable, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember, who goes home justified? It's not the Pharisee that prays, thank you, God, that I'm not like all these other people. Thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I tithe of everything I receive. We're not justified by being a good moral Christian, a good believer, a good Christian man, a good Christian woman. Who goes home justified? It's the tax collector who all he can do is beat his chest and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's the one who is a cheat and knows it and is broken by it. Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, the sinner, he went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Here's the point. If we look to anything besides Christ to justify us, even our Christian zeal and obedience, as good as those things are, not only will they fail us, but they'll end up dividing us separating us from God and from each other. They drive a wedge between us. It's only when we look to Jesus to satisfy us, not only will we be completely secure in our union to him, but we'll be united to every other man, woman, and child who's also clinging to him through faith. That's the good news of justification. <clears throat> I can't say it any better than Charles Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. So I'm actually going to give him the final word this morning. But C.H. Spurgeon has this to say about justification. If you hear nothing else from this morning's sermon, please listen to this. Spurgeon says, remember, it is not your hold of Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It is not your joy in Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It is not even faith in Christ, though that is the instrument. It is Christ's blood and merits. Then he says this, Therefore, look not so much to your hand with which you are grasping Christ as to Christ. Look not to your hope, but to Jesus, the source of your hope. Look not to your faith, but to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And then Spurgeon says, we shall never find happiness by looking at our prayers, our doings, our feelings. It is what Jesus is, not what we are, that gives rest to the soul. I'll propose this to you. Finish the sentence this way. I will finally be able to rest when Jesus. When Jesus. So whether it's for the first time or the 500th time, look to Jesus, put aside your righteousness, and cling to his righteousness that will never fail you. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your word, how it is alive and active even today in our midst. And so we ask that by the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit, would you apply your word to our hearts and minds? Would you help us loosen our grip on all the false sources of justification and righteousness that we love to cling to? And would you help us cling to Jesus? We ask this for our own sake, 
but also so that we might be ambassadors of Christ and the reconciliation that comes through him. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you, uh, would you please stand with me as you're able as we sing in response to God's word, hymn 284. Hymn 284, they'll know we are Christians by our love. 